noticing. Oh that. my God, the people are just jumping in. You've you got what. the je ne sais quoi. Oh, okay. Here come people. I'm seeing people showing up. Oh, there's hundreds of people, millions. Oh my gosh. Yes, millions. And now really, I, still, I feel like I'm on Romper Room because I want to say I see Stephen, I see Victoria, I see. Do you Lisa. know, I was on Romper Room. No, I didn't know that. I was on Romper Room once. Ooh, I should add that to my like. Yes, you TV. should. That's, I should that's that on good, my website. That's a good random fact. Yeah, I'm I was like, on Romper Room. If you ever do the, the, the Dion Masterclass series, uh -huh. one of the things when you introduce yourself is to ask for a random fact, and that would be a good one. Someone was, somebody was talking about that. That must be where they got that from. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Business, everyone, you know, we are nothing if not business-like on Cup of Joe. Okay. And also, I'm going to be very good and not say anything inappropriate or weird. Really? So then I don't have to do any editing afterwards. Okay. Hello, gorgeous people. We have a full house. Um, let me preface with we have a very specific um, plan for this call. So um, as always, if you have a question, the new rule doesn't apply to this call. The new rule is we only take quirky questions, but not for this call, because for this call, we're going to be learning how to make our lives dynamite by being super productive and organized and get our heads around um, getting things done, which is a program I've listened to myself, um, tried to listen to a few times and got completely freaked out at the amount of prep and work involved. And my brain just did that thing where it's like, oh, no, 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 I can't do this. Um, and Stephen, as we all know, is a guru at this kind of stuff. And he volunteered to come and kind of give us a cheat sheet and help us out. But what we're gonna do is, We'll take questions the last kind of 15 minutes of the call. Please, if you have a question, type in big caps questions, question. I'll let you know when they open up. And that way we can we can keep to the one subject and not kind of get diverted. Let Stephen, you know, show slides or whatever and and talk us through exactly mm -hmm. what getting things done is. Now, now Stephen. We all know mm -hmm. Stephen. Stephen doesn't need any introduction. We all know him. Aww. We all love him. Um, all your cup of Joe calls like garner thousands of views. So it's like the no introduction needed. You're you're what is it they call when you have a resident, like a talk show has a resident person they have on all the time? I don't know, but I like the idea. I like yeah, the idea of, of being uh, of, of being resident to cup of Joe. That's kind of nice. Yeah, I like that. Or MSNBC, I think, has them. Like right. the person that they call when they ever need the proper advice. That's Stephen Cohen. Okay. okay. So getting things done. Mm -hmm. Avon Shore is the first person that I heard about it from. And I was all eager and excited. And I went and got the audiobook. And then, and she did warn me, but I didn't believe her. There was that bit where he was like, okay, now you need to take five or six days out of your life and spend an entire day going through your emails and an entire day. And that freaked me out. Yeah, and, absolutely. But I confess, and I don't know if I'm the only one here. I've had the same email since the internet began. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid because anytime I've tried to clean it out, I've deleted things I didn't want to delete. I've ended up overwhelmed and I've given up. Right. So, and, okay. You know, files so me, and everything. Yeah. So, help us. All right. So, just to back up. So, I, I started off working in theater, went for a while, taught, and then went for a while writing software, and then worked my way back to doing what we're doing. During that second part of the hiatus, while I was working on software, I had this one boss. His name was Charlie, and he was absolutely enamored, not only with GTD, with getting things done, but also with every new piece of software that came out that was supposed to make that easier for you. And so we kept every week getting dropped on our laps, yet another one of these things and yet another one of these things. And I found that overwhelming. I also found all the GTD advice kind of overwhelming. But in seeing all the software kind of parade by me, I began to understand a few things. And one of the things I understood is you don't need a special tool. And that most of the time when we're being sold a special tool, it's not that the tool doesn't do the job. It's really that we have so much data in our lives right now mm -hmm. that um, we're so drowning in it 
that when people say, well, I'm going to give you more information, we are addicted to more information is better, but there are times when less information is really all we need. And there's a lot of general tools that can be used for a purpose built thing, like getting things done. Like one thing is you don't actually, to do um, part of what you were talking about with, with the cleaning out your, your email inbox, sometimes it's referred to as email bankruptcy. You know, I, I bet there are many people on this call who like have thousands of, of emails in their I inbox do. and they mark them as unread because they haven't dealt with them yet. So they have this huge number sitting there. Well, I know you use um, Microsoft. So you use Hotmail and, and Outlook yeah. and I use Gmail, but in both cases you can archive mail as opposed to deleting it. And if what we think about is this, let's think about what getting things done is supposed to be. Getting things done is supposed to be a way for you to have a list of tasks in front of you that are living in whatever your trusted system is. And you can have a dedicated trusted system or you can turn something else into your trusted system. But it is a way for you to have a, a set of tasks that you can easily triage. You follow the same method to triage them and then you can move on. And as long as you come back and triage which is work your way through and setting priorities. As long as you do that on a semi-regular basis, you don't get lost. So if the very first thing I say is that you don't have to delete those emails as much as if you were to simply archive anything that is over, let's say two weeks old, it's still in there. If you need that email, you can still go get it, but it is no longer sitting in your inbox. This is if we are treating your inbox as that trusted system where everything goes into. Um, can you share, can you give me permission yes, to share my screen? And see, that's where I, I'm gonna give you host permission as we speak. Okay. That's everyone, can you please make sure that you're muted? Um, I think we all are, but just to be safe. Um, okay. That's where I run into trouble because yeah. it's like the taxes. I'm very organized in the moment and I am, I know it's not ideal, but I, respond immediately to everything. It's my kind of nature. I need to stop it. Um, so I don't have any unread or undealt with emails. I've got everything in a spreadsheet I action. But my problem is all the past things, mm -hmm. all the filing. I've got boxes yeah. of like, I've got nowhere to put paper bills that come. I've got boxes of things. Anytime I do the taxes, yeah. I should be doing it every week, but I've got no... right. System. Well, if I walk through this, so the first thing is this is a four minute read. That's one thing that I really appreciate about how Medium sets these things up. If the idea of email bankruptcy is new to you, then this four minute read really is enough to give you the basics on the idea of that. I'm just going to pop the link to this into the chat okay, so people can see it. Um, I'm mostly not seeing the chat because when Danielle, when Daniela brought that up, I figured it would distract me. So I just yeah. wanted to bring this article in case the idea of declaring email bankruptcy is a new one to you. Um, and now I just need to make the little, the little, the little uh, thing go away so I can boop, switch tabs on my end. And of course, it's not letting me. So I'm going to I'm going to stop my share for a minute and switch back, switch back okay. and forth because it's being a little weird on my end. So when I was mentioning triaging, mm -hmm. this may be a new term um, for people. But what I'm talking about is you need to evaluate importance wise what it is and, and when are you going to work on it. And that article actually mentions uh, a basic triage method. So I'm going to show you again. Yep, desktop, it should come back up. You're seeing what's generally called the Eisenhower matrix, and you're seeing four squares. Down the left is important, non-important, and across the top is urgent, not urgent. So if something is important and urgent, you do this as soon as possible. If something, <laughs> is, if something is important and not urgent, you schedule it for when you're going to get it done. Because if something is important and not urgent, it's like, okay, when am I going to get this done, right? If something isn't urgent, if something is urgent but not important, then you are not the person who necessarily needs to get this done. You can delegate. Now I can, I, let's come back to delegation because I had to learn a whole lesson on that. But if something is not urgent and not important, you wanna limit how often you're doing it. 
So essentially, if you're looking at that email inbox, and if you're just trying to figure out which of these four squares does something fall into, if it is not urgent and not important, odds are you can delete it without much of a problem because it may be that you were included on an email chain. It may be, you know, whatever it is, it's not something you need to deal with. This is something that's easily deletable. Whereas the other things you need to deal with. Now, both Outlook, Hotmail, and Gmail have a way of scheduling, of snoozing your email. So that way they disappear from the inbox now and will come back later on. In that case, that's what I use scheduling for. If I'm looking and I'm like, well, this is, this is something that I don't have all the information to take care of right now. This is something where I'm going to have to talk to somebody first. So I, I snooze the email so it disappears from my inbox, but I make a mental guess as to when I will have the information to do that and, the, and it will pop back into my inbox at that point. Okay. If you've never used the snooze feature in either of those things, and most email today now has this ability because it learned it from getting things done. You just have to look up how your program does that. Okay. It will, again, disappear from the inbox. So it won't be there in front of you as something to do, but it's something that will come up later. Delegate, obviously, when I'm doing Spoken Realm stuff, it's stuff that I might hand off to Giovanna or Adriana or one of the other people I work with. It's that, okay, this person tends to deal with social media. This is a cover art issue. Let me send it off this way. And so I, I delegate it. It leaves my inbox because I trust the person that I've delegated it to, mm -hmm. which leaves me just with the things that I, that I have to do. What and was my, the lesson? What was the lesson you had to learn about that? I'll, I'll, I'll get back okay. to that in a minute. But, but here's the hard part. What's the difference between what I can do right now and what I have to schedule? Basically, if something is going to take more than five minutes of my time, mm -hmm. I schedule it because when I'm sitting at my email, it's I do that a couple of times a day where I try to go through, take care of all the things I can take care of right now. And if I'm thinking, well, I'm going to go record for a few hours, I'll answer that email at one in the afternoon. I'll snooze it so it disappears for now, but it'll pop back in at one in the afternoon, which might be the next time I'm going through my email. Okay. It Does, does that make sense? Yep. Um, now, which was the part? Oh, the delegating part. Yeah. So when I um, when I was bringing Spoken Realms, when it was basically an idea that came through a business incubator, my my advisor there, his name is Jay, said to me, "You need to make three lists, Stephen. You need to make a list of things that you are comfortable delegating right now, a list of things that you know that you don't necessarily need to do, but you're too scared to let somebody else do." And then a list of things that absolutely require you to be the person to get them done. Now, the two extreme lists, the ones where I, I felt comfortable handing things off and the things that actually needed me to do them are two very, very short lists. And the one in the middle was this long list of things yeah. because I was being <laughs> honest with myself and going, yeah, really, somebody else could do this, but I want, you know. And so yeah. as I started to trust the people that I was delegating things to, then I became more comfortable handing off things. Um, in what we do, if you have people who you commonly work with when it comes to proofing, if you have, um, if, if you use any of the online sites to hire someone to help you take care of office stuff so you can focus on what you do in the booth, it doesn't even have to be for a long amount of time. It can be something that's very short. But if you have those people, over time, you turn around and you're like, hey, could you double check this for me? Because I need to, let's say, like in my case, pay out royalties. And I would like somebody else aside from me to double check to make sure that all the data looks correct before I hit the pay button. That yeah. kind of a deal. Right. And so as you work with people on small things that are inconsequential, over time, you get more and more comfortable handing them the things off the middle list. I'm again going to stop the screen share because the way my screen seems to be working, it's not letting me easily flip through this without starting and stopping them for whatever reason, but I've got my work around. So if you've never seen that snooze feature before, this is how it looks in Gmail, where when I click on an email, I click on that little clock and I choose what times, and I can actually customize those times 
so they fit my schedule. So what I'm winding up with is I could schedule something to pop up later in the day, I can later in the week, but it's always based upon when do I think I'm going to have the information to be able to address whatever this is in five minutes or less. So it may mean there are a couple of meetings. It may mean I have to prep a book first. It may mean that I have to hear back from this publisher before I can reach out and schedule something over there. But that snooze feature is there. And if you don't know how the snooze feature in your email program works, then just doing a quick search on it to figure it out. But this is one of the things that many email programs did learn from the getting things done idea. I love this idea because it's a hard stop on, um, because I have to be honest, it started when I became a narrator Mm -hmm. and I would get that exciting book. And Mm -hmm. so all it takes is a couple of times of like the heavy hit of endorphins when you get that exciting book. Now I'm like a rat or what is it? Pavlov's dogs, that email notification. And I know you turn the notifications off, but if I turn the notifications off, I'll miss the exciting email. Right. (laughs) It's, right. Like most and, of them are crap. Right. And you and I actually talked about something before the call about how we schedule and you and I schedule differently. Mm-hmm. I, I don't schedule my books back to back. And I, I learned this lesson too many times when a publisher would reach out to me saying, we need you right away. And because I had scheduled all my projects back to back, I wasn't going to be available for a month and a half. And I lost a project that I really wanted. Mm. So instead, I tend to schedule like Swiss cheese. I schedule leaving a book size space in between, and then I come back and backfill. And by working that way, yeah, it does mean that occasionally I wind up with a few days off here and there. But it means that I have, when somebody calls and asks for a rush job, instead of me saying, I'm not available for a month and a half, often I'm saying, can we shift your requested window for three days? Because then I can do the job. And that's the most professional way. It's that Neil Gaiman thing that he talks about when when you're talking about contracting. Contractors Mm -hmm. have to do three things or really only have to do, only ever have to do two of the three things. Uh, Do good work, uh, deliver on time, and be a pleasure to work with. You really only have to do two of those things, right? If you do good work and you deliver on time, if you're a little bit of a pain in the butt, it's okay. If you do good work and you're a pleasure to work with and the work is a little bit late, they'll forgive you, right? So you only ever need to do two of those three, but as long as you try to keep those three things in sight, and if you've overscheduled yourself, you are immediately not doing your best work, no matter what you do. If you're not getting enough sleep, if you're really stressing out, there's no way you're doing your best work. So now you absolutely have to do the other two. You know, you have to deliver it on time and you have to be just sunshine and, and, and rainbows and unicorns, right? Because you know for a fact that you are not delivering your best work at that point. So now you have, you absolutely have to do those other two things. Because what, because no matter how focused and good you get, what I'm finding is with me, the mind is willing and I, and I'm a nut. I mean, I am capable of doing a damn good job, but the voice, the mm-hmm. body, the breath, right. your body will just say, nope, sorry, not playing anymore. <laughs> right. And for me, so here's a major, so I am not trying to schedule my life around people who have a Monday to Friday, you know, standard yeah, exactly. sort of calendar. So there aren't kids at home. There isn't a partner here that I'm trying to make sure that I, that I have the same days off as. So because of that, when I wind up with those days off between projects, that's my weekend. That might be a Wednesday and a yeah. Thursday. I do that between right? books. That's exactly. Because you have like a palate cleanse. Yep, right. So for me, I never know what days of the week those days off are going to be. But somebody who's really wonderful about doing the other thing where you're trying to make your schedule fit with other people's is Andy Arndt. Oh, she's like, oh my God. She's like the shining yeah. possibility. And she's like, you know, the girl on the beach in Bali doing the headstand that when like, I almost want to give up and never exercise again. I No, 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 no. I mean, but that's the thing. Andy Arndt is the headstand girl when it comes to scheduling. She is 
a guru. But, but right, but the, the thing is, Andy actually was totally surrounded both with the spouse and the kids trying to figure out how to make everything work with that kind of a schedule. Oh, yeah. So she is a wonderful person to talk to if what you're trying to do is that. In my case, since I don't have those things constricting my schedule, then I I can actually sort of I can spend my time focused on the project and just say my days off are Thursday and Friday this week, which is a different. Do you not get tempted kind of to blur the lines? Do you not get tempted to overwork or? Oh yeah, there are definitely times where I go from one project into a next. Like like I'm going to go from the book that I'm currently doing right into a book for Harper, just because that's how this one happened to work out, right? Right, but and it's Harper. After the book, right. <laughs> Right. And then after the book for Harper, I'm going to have, I think, basically a week, unless a short project pops up in the middle that I'm doing. Right. So something may show up that I'm doing between there and my next other, you know, the next other project. But you see, that's that's brilliant what you've just said, because this is my nefarious plan. Okay. I am up for a book that I would kill for, but it's such a short deadline and I'm not holding my I never I don't I would kill for it, but I don't care on the other hand. Like until mm -hmm. it happens, it didn't happen. I learned that from acting. A pencil is definitely a very faded pencil, <laughs> it's, but it would take me a week. So I've put it in my calendar as if it's going ahead. So if it goes ahead, mm -hmm. then great. You know, I'm there, you know, pucka. If it doesn't go ahead, then I'm going to use that week after this call and mm -hmm. take that time to look at those boxes where I've been putting the bills and get a ground base for my tax spreadsheet so that I can, as you said, triage and also so I can file properly going forward, knowing then I'll be caught up and I won't end up with like a couple of suicidal days at the end of the year. Right, right. I'm, I'm popping uh, a link to a JPEG into every, into the chat window. Uh, oh, I can I share it this. On, on the screen. Uh, so I'm going to do the screen share thing again. But uh, so it came out of the book that we're talking about, the getting things done methodology. What's great about this particular image is uh, this really encapsulates everything that's going on. Uh, I'm going to shrink it so you can sort of see it from a distance and then come back in to see it. Yeah. What, who you yeah. want to be is you want to be the person over here as opposed to the per you, actually, no, you don't want to be the person over here where everything is coming down uncontrolled. This is, I just deal with everything as it shows up and hope everything works out. What this is all about is figuring out how to have organized inputs that then allow you to create new things and then you have organized yes. inputs that moves around. That's this what way. I want, please. Right. So let's talk about what this, <laughs> how this works. So life is full of random stuff and there's random inputs. Okay. So the very first thing when something shows up is, well, what is it? Your very next question is, is this actionable? Is this something that I need to have an action about? Yes or no. If it's not actionable, it might be trash because it just might be a notice that something is happening that you don't care about. It might be an idea you can't do anything about now, in which case you want to incubate it meaning that you want to you want to mark it to come back at some later date to something that gets triggered later or whatever or it's reference it's interesting information but there's nothing that is something you can do about it. and so you file that for reference wherever that is it so is that like podcasts or webinars with it could be right it, it, or or a notice about a a conference that you were thinking might be interesting to go to, or maybe there are authors who you'd like to work with who you've been stalking on social media. But if you put it in reference, does it can't it just never be remembered again? Or do you it could be, but the, the point of reference more is when something comes up later that is actionable, you right. then look that person up in reference to see what you filed. Oh, okay. Right? Okay, so, so the so the podcast or the things you want to listen to would not go in there because you do have an action against right. those, just not an immediate exactly. action. Right, right, right. Yeah. So if you if if you let's say we're using Gmail and you made a tag called possible author or author, right? Okay. And so you just file it under author and then you look up that author when you're trying to 
do that work and you see all the things you've collected so you can actually have that intelligent conversation when you do have something that's actionable so those are all the not actionables oh my god you're so organized (laughs) so you then move past this so now it is actionable so remember our square from before well if it's less than five minutes this says if less than two but i've expanded to less than five if it's five minutes or less just do it right respond to the email ask the question fill out the form, do whatever it is and get it done so you can get it off your plate. If it's not less than five minutes, can you delegate it? Meaning, can you hand it off to somebody else who you're working with? Um, if, If it isn't something you can delegate, it becomes something you defer, something you mark to do for later. Usually you defer something when you need more information and you can't get it done now. So that's what this is all about. That, that's what, and so I, like I said, the link is now in the chat. You can actually grab a copy of this image to sort of see what it is. Um, and then this is where you're figuring it out. What can I do? What can I do in the time that I have? What do I have the energy to do? You figure this part out for yourself. And then this is just a way of thinking about things. This is where it kind of, th- this is the actions. Oh, this other so, stuff is for later. You know, so, so you start at this point and then you can go back to your old files and file them into this structure. I right. was starting the other way around. You were going to abandon everything and say, oh my God. What? No, no, no. Yeah, that's you, what I thought you were supposed to do. I didn't know you can. You can, you okay. can do that. Okay. This, this makes a lot more sense to me because we're never coming at this stuff totally open and free. You know, we, we have existing stuff that we're trying to figure out how to manage. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the rest of the stuff on this form is good information. Like you have unplanned work, work that just showed up, right? You have predefined work and you have work that you're going to define. When it's talking about horizons of focus, we've all heard somebody say, well, give me the 50,000 foot view where they're talking about they need the overview. That's what all of this stuff is about. Okay. Um, you know, and what you're trying to be is you're trying to be this person as opposed to the just standing here hoping you get it right, which is where a lot of us are. This is when you get into that fake it till you make it mindset, uh, because we instead of trying to figure out how to organize, we wind up there. So right now, organizing wise, we've only used an email client to organize. And I maintain that all you need are three things, an email client a calendar and your contact list whether that you know whether that's apple's address book google contacts you don't need a purposefully built crm con, uh, uh, customer man, um, customer resource management tool also, you don't need that i'm just thinking i just recently put an out of office message on my facebook narrators mm-hmm. page directing them to my email saying i don't monitor this box Right. I'm thinking I'm going to look and see if I can do that with Twitter. And it, I'm getting messages all the time where you have to make these kind of decisions on LinkedIn, Twitter, now Instagram and TikTok, right. which I'm not even never even ended up being on much. And mm-hmm. you're spending all day feeling like you have to respond. And those platforms tell them you've seen the message. Right. So no, you feel I, like you I, have I, to answer. Right. So for me, this was the big thing uh, it was actually... When you talk to Scott Brick later on, there was something that Scott had, uh, I heard Scott say, actually, not long after I started narrating, he talked about hiring people to help you do research, hiring people to help you do the business, and that really the important thing was you being in the booth. And it was a really hard thing for me to do at first, but I started doing that pretty early. And so if you can imagine finding somebody who is going to give you maybe five hours of social media management a week, or even less than that, let's just say two a week right? You're hiring somebody for a month for a total of, let's say, 10 hours. And you ask that they do two, two and a half hours a week. That person, while they're making sure all the new stuff goes out, sees the messages and and they understand who you are. They forward you the ones that are important and they ignore the ones that aren't, right? So that's part of what I've got set up because of Spoken Realms. But really, if Scott hadn't said that, at some event way back in the beginning, I probably wouldn't have done it, but I, I really think it was game changing because anything that keeps me out of the booth is keeping me from doing part of the work I want to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm at that. I'm at that 
panic stage. Like if I was just a narrator, I'd be fine. If I just worked every minute until the new year, if I just had cup of Joe, I'd be fine because we've got two calls a week now till the new year. But that and that, and then the, you know, and I, but you love the contact with people and you love answering messages and you don't want them to think that you haven't, you're not answering immediately. Right, right, right. And here's, here's an interesting thing. You know, we, we're all conditioned to try to be on all the social media platforms. Yeah. Um, They're not all a good fit for everybody. And main, and maintaining a presence on a platform that you just don't get is not so useful. What I'm finding for myself is for, for a myriad of reasons, I backed off of Facebook. Um, I'm not all that happy with Instagram, usually in part because of the connection with Facebook. And I can get a lot out of, out of Twitter of what I get out of Facebook as well. And it just so happened that for me, Twitter wound up being the tool that I have the easiest connection with, right? I know for other people, that's totally different that, you know, Natalie Nottis on Instagram and TikTok is incredible. Those platforms really gel with who she is. And she does beautiful work on both of them, getting, you know, not getting herself noticed and helping pull people together. Great stuff. You know, See, I, I'm a Facebook girl mm-hmm. and Joe's on right. Facebook, Instagram. They're like, check this out. And I go and look, it's just a picture. I'm like, what, mm-hmm. what, where? I don't know what button to push. Well, yeah. What, what, <laughs> what I'm saying is that if you direct everybody, instead of trying, if you direct everybody back to one social media, do one social media platform and do it well. Oh, okay. Right. You know, put on your other social media platforms in the bio. I mean, on my Facebook, it says, I'm not here much. If you want to contact me, come over to Twitter. That's very smart. I might do that. Pick, pick the one. That. So if in your case, that's Facebook, then just make sure to put into the other profiles. Here's the link to me on Facebook. I'm there more often than I'm here. It's not yeah. putting down the platform that they're on, but it's yeah. letting them know that if they want to get you, they come to they come to you in the other place. That's that's smart, and it's not putting it. I don't personally right. hate any platform. I just oh me neither. You know, I just I'm on Facebook too much to have time for my I own get it. life. I totally <laughs> get it. I totally get it. So, so you yeah. don't have to go through all those boxes of files of old documents. Oh, no. No, not at once. Over time, what's going to happen is it's slowly going to happen for you, and especially if what you do is if you get comfortable allowing yourself to archive the thousands of emails that are in your inbox. So instead of, so they're still in all mail or they're in archived mail or whatever your email program calls them. If you hold your inbox for things that you are trying to triage, then you will have 15 things in your inbox. You will realize that five of them you can delete. Two of them you have to defer. Three of them you have to send to somebody else for more information. And that leaves you with five that you actually need to do something with now. The the inbox is then empty. You then go and work and you say, well, after lunch today, I'm going to come back and look again. And some more things will have come in and you're working your way through that. So instead of keeping your email inbox as the place where all the thousands of things live, if you keep the inbox for what's actionable, then it becomes a small hill instead of a large mountain, if that makes sense. And you can and you can do that with the paper. You can do that. I'm trying to think of everything in life. You can do that with yeah. paper mail that comes. You can do yeah. that with your tax. Well, well that's one taxes, thing. But that's can, one thing that the medium article talks about is is when everybody got physical mail all the time. Nobody ever stuck the mail back in their mailbox because they weren't ready to read it yet. <laughs> I think I would now. <laughs> they can right, be I mean, blowing. We, Exactly. So it's like we automatically were triaging. We would go bill, bill, add, add, bill, bill, letter. Oh my God, somebody sent me a letter, right? And then we would we would make that value judgment in that moment. But we're not doing that anymore. And I find um, it when it's also very emotion based. Do you not find because when I worked for a corporate company, I had money mm-hmm. just coming in left, right, and center. I was I was a guru. I had a balance spreadsheet. I had my my schedule spreadsheet. I knew exactly what penny, how much I was spending on right. food. But now I'm like afraid to like look, you know. And it's not like I'm like broke or dying, but the whole freelance right. thing can be overwhelming and scary. Well, and I mean, part of the problem is there's a whole industry 
trying to sell us sell us tools. So there's an industry selling to us as freelancers. Hmm. And they're all trying to convince us that we need their tool in order to be organized enough to make a living. Yeah. And I'm not saying there isn't value in those things. Um, those tools can really help if you're completely lost. But really, your, if you treat your email inbox as a trusted system, it is a database of messages, right? The same thing is true of your, um, of your, contact, of, of your contact list. So I'm going to share something. and You could triage so, your whole life. I could triage right. my diet and my exercise. Right. So what I've got here is this is my con this is my list of contacts in uh, Gmail. But what I've done and what I wanted to show you Careful. is you know what's everyone's along the scribbling here. furiously, and this is going to be on YouTube. Well, well, that's part of the reason why I chose what's up here because okay. the people who are showing here, you're not really getting a lot of okay. that. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Um, erroneously filling anyone's rates. inbox, right? Okay. What I really wanted to show you was this along the side. What you're seeing is, if you see these these five entries here, you see that I used the, what would that be? That would be the greater than sign, and then the name of a particular publisher, and all the people who are in casting are in that group. So when I go to write an email, I do... I put that little sign and then I suddenly see just those five things because the only things that show up here are, the only things that start with a greater than sign are the different casting departments. So I don't have to remember, well, who, who's in casting at Simon & Schuster? I've got, I figured that out. I only needed to figure it out once and I put it in my contact list, right? So when who's you go, in, so you don't do the search drop down just to Right, I just email. start, right, I, I type, Tantor casting and the three people who do casting for Tantor suddenly are in the two field, right? And I separate it out by using the greater than sign because I can type that very easily on a keyboard. And then I just choose which publisher off that list. This is something different. In here, current, future, and past are people who I currently have projects with people who I'd like to have projects with in the future who I am, have not worked with yet, and people who I worked with in the past who I'd like to get another project with. And so these lists, I just, I used a character that I couldn't type very easily because this isn't about making an email thing about it as much as it is about um, these are these are ones that I want to keep track of using the contact list as a database, instead of paying for a dedicated CRM program when I can really just use what's here. The same thing is true about the other things, authors, casting people, people generally in publishing, um, you know, and, and, and then you wind up with other things. But using labels as far as, con uh, as, far as the Google contact list is concerned is the same thing as using tags and Apple and, and, and whatever. All of these things are just that. What they do is they give you a way for you to keep the information. You can put in people's spouses, people's birth dates, all that stuff there. So you have a very basic CRM already in whatever contact list you are using. What I like about this one is if I show up at an in-person conference, let's say we have a future where we get to do that again. And I see somebody from, from Hachette on the other side of the room. And I think, oh, wait a minute. I haven't worked with them yet, but I do know some things about them. I just open up my phone and I look through the contact list before I walk over to say hello, to remind me of whatever I've written in there in addition so got to their it all name. there, rather exactly. I have it on an Excel spreadsheet that's not necessarily on my phone right. or up and, to date. But what right. about And thinking? so since it's in the contact list, it's in my phone and I'm able to check it before I walk over without needing a dedicated piece of software. Can I ask, is this all, how do you sync? Because I tried, you know, the Google OneDrive? Yep. I almost lost half my files because I thought beast, I put everything on a hard drive because right. I'm so scared. What, I, what I'm talking about sync. doing, right. What I'm talking about doing for, since you use Outlook, since you use Hotmail and Outlook, I'm talking about using the built-in contact list that's there, right? Yeah, see, I don't ever trust them. So I put it well, on my if spreadsheet. You were, right. 
if you were using the one that's there, then all you'd have to do is make sure you had the right Check app on your phone. phone and you'd be able to open up that app and see see what's there. So yeah. you're right. You're keeping it on the spreadsheet and you might remember stuff better because you are retyping stuff onto the spreadsheet. Yeah. I am trusting the system. I am trusting an external system because I figure if Google goes away, there are much bigger problems in the world than, 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 my, than me and my business. If there were a situation where all of that were to disappear, then the world's in much bigger trouble and my, and my contact list is secondary. I'm not worried right. about them disappearing. I'm worried about me hitting the wrong button. <laughs> well, it's not that something. I don't have, right. It, it's not that I don't have backups of the information. Okay. But so since I'm using Google tools and, the, and I use an Android phone, the default contact list on here has all the information I put into that. I have an Android, so I should look into right. that. Since you, since you use Android and you use Microsoft tools, if you put the Outlook app on your phone and there is oh, actually- I've got Outlook on my phone. Yeah, there is also a dedicated Microsoft launcher for Android that customizes everything so that you get all of that. I, um, if you type in Microsoft and launcher, L-A-U-N-C-H-E-R, into the Google Play Store, you will find something that would customize the way your phone looks and acts that would put all of your Microsoft stuff front and center on that phone. Same thing is true if you're using an iPhone and Apple Mail and all of that. You use the default tools that are built in in this same way. And that will all just work. See, I think it's one of those, it gets harder before it gets easier. It does because you have to <laughs> learn what well, all I, what I had to do was I had to think, well, I'm already using Gmail. Mm -hmm. Well, if I'm already using Gmail, then if I lean into using Google calendars, if I lean into using Google's contact list, then I have very easy ways to make those things work. The same thing held true when I was running all Mac stuff, right? I was using Apple Mail. I was using iCal. I was doing all of that because those things were part of the ecosystem and it made it just easy. It all just worked. Yeah. Same thing is true if you're in the Microsoft ecosystem, if you lean into it and you use everything that's built into Outlook, you've got all the tools that I've just talked about just with slightly different names already there. It is, and I think we all do it a bit, and I've noticed it's not a very attractive trait, but I tend to get very, you know, I mean, I think I still have a Walkman somewhere. And, you know, I mean, with cassettes and everything, I like, I get annoyed and pissed off if something's mm -hmm. really good and they get rid of it. And they do it yeah. all the time and I just lose my and like I was walking around with you know mp3 files and putting them on an mp3 player you yeah. can't buy an mp3 player anymore I've got cupboards full no, of cds <laughs> yeah. you know and so it's like you have to move there's no point in standing up for your rights and doing things old school because when the world moves on you're left out well you know and I have heard people make the argument that they want you know, they would like this to be a separate layer as opposed to doing what I'm doing, which is which is basically realizing that I already have the tools built into email, built sure. into my contact list, built into my calendar. And there are a few tools that are very, very useful and which are either free or inexpensive that people do use for exactly that. And um, let me just hit this. So Streak uh, works with Gmail. And, and I'm not doing this as a commercial. I've used it, I don't use it now. But this was very, the free version of Streak is very, very useful for what we do, especially if you ignore mail merge and uh, you don't need the mail merge. Don't bother mail using merge? the mail merge. They've got something where if you were sending out email to lots of people, you could write a generic email, it would do a mail merge and then allow you to track it. Oh, and yeah. And they, you can see that the more you pay, the more you can do. Um, I'm not a fan of it for a couple of reasons, but I didn't want to get into that now. Email tracking is the other thing that I'm also not a fan of. Yeah. No, the mail merge, I used for, I worked for a recruitment company and yeah. they would send out all these emails to hundreds of candidates. Right. Dear, I got one, dear, and I worked there. Dear Mr. Velasquez, after carefully considering your CV. Right. You know what I mean? I do. So I do good. know. <laughs> right. So what I'm, 
so where I've come to with this is, I'm gonna bring this back to their first one here. So essentially this acts as a, a Gmail plugin and okay, adds okay. to your Gmail, if you use Gmail, um, the kinds of features that I then eventually realized, well, wait a minute, I don't need the plugin. I could organize my stuff in Gmail organically. It was great using this tool for about a month and a half where I then realized, oh, oh, I don't need the tool. I could label things. I could sleep things. I can do that all without the tool. But it was great to have somebody else's template of how to do that so that I could get comfortable working with it, if that made okay. sense. So what is very useful about this was not necessarily, yes, buy into it, get their thing, try the free thing, understand the organization they're trying to help you understand. The thing that they really are trying to teach you is something called a sales funnel. Yeah, if you've heard that term before. I don't understand what, what it is. I know what okay. I know it, so but I don't know what it is. Right. So a sales funnel, if you think of a funnel, you're thinking of a large end and a small end. Yeah. And yeah. the large end obviously has many more things than the small end does. The large end is every person who you've spoken to, but you haven't worked with yet. Right. And then if it takes you two or three contacts to create a relationship, and then you have to have nurture the relationship for a while before you wind up getting cast in a project, you are slowly watching that large group of people you've encountered become a smaller and smaller group of people, eventually getting down to the people who you work with on a regular basis. And then once that project is done, you want to see if you can feed that person back into the funnel, because since you're already in a known quantity, they will move through the funnel faster. So Streak is a very good tool for you to learn that concept so that you can mess with it for a bit and go, oh, now I get it. And then you get to the place where that thing that I had where current and past and future, that's my version of what I needed to have from the sales tool, from, from that okay. funnel. Okay. That was really all I wound up realizing. I don't need the rest of it. I don't need to know these other things. I just need to know, is there somebody new who I've encountered who I haven't worked with yet so I can keep their email there to remind me that I need to do more outreach to talk to that person, understand what they're casting, see if what they're casting is something that I might work on or if what they're casting may not be for me, but maybe I know somebody who I can say, hey, wait a minute, you need to talk to this narrator because they seem to be a good match for the kind of stuff you're doing. Okay. So whatever that is, working in that way, that was really all I needed to take away from it. And this was a good tool for that. Um, now, if, um, yeah. I'm conscious that we're on yeah. a good roll, but I'm conscious you guys, if you've got any questions for Stephen about getting things While done, you start do that, to type them in. I just want to show you two other things. Yeah, that's um, what I'm thinking. We can we can yeah. we can finish up what you're doing while they're if you've got any right. questions, type them now and then I'll Right. So Omni Group were, were actually Mac OS 10 developers long before it was called Mac OS 10. When Steve Jobs was not at Apple and it was Next Computers, Omni made software for Next. So they've been around on OS 10 even before it was OS 10. Omni Focus and Omni Organize and Omni Plan are great Mac centric tools that feel like they were built for Mac OS X. So if you are a person who just loves that aesthetic, loves that like, oh my God, it all just goes together. It feels so Mac-like. Take a look at the software from Omni Group, at least as a trial. Because so you have to use it on Mac? Yeah, that's a Mac only tool, but I wanted okay. to bring it up because I know a lot of people are like going, yeah, but I don't want it. I'm going, I get it. Yeah. When yeah. I was on Mac, their tools were definitely some of the ones that were, were worth using simply because they integrated incredibly well into the Mac ecosystem and they were beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you and I both know that, I mean, we sit around working in a little box. If we don't make the environment pretty, mm -hmm. if we don't, take some time to care about the environment we're working in that, you know, and that, especially with, with, with Mac users that sometimes can spill over into, into what the software looks like and feels I like. I do miss Mac. I've got to say because of the colors, because of the design yeah. abilities, because of how sleek it was. I do yeah. miss Mac. I've got to say, but I'm just too embedded. 
Right. And so yeah. here, here's one last one. This is totally the opposite. Imagine, if you will, somebody who's so incredibly scattered, they never know where they are. They never know what they're going to have access to, but they would like all of their information to wind up in one place somehow. But they don't want to have to think about how. This was one of the great old pieces of software. It's called Remember the Milk. Remember the Milk has been around forever. It's one of the original organizing pieces of software. And what Remember the Milk does is it allows you to give it stuff by text, give it stuff by IM, give it stuff by email, give it stuff by everything, no matter what you use. And it will put it into a, into a list for you to triage. Oh, so I like if, that. If, if you are totally inundated with 20 million different things and you're going, and you get some things via text and some things this way and that way, what's great about this tool is you don't have to think about where is it coming in. There is always a way in Remember the Milk for you to be able to send stuff into your trusted system, whatever it is. And I mean, through Skype, through through everything, you can tweet at it, you can do whatever you need to and get stuff into your, your system. It's not the simplest one. It's definitely not the newest one. It's been around forever. But whereas a lot of the other things have come and gone, I mean, they've been around long enough, they still talk about BlackBerry. That's how you know they're old. Too bad, too bad you have to tweet into them because wouldn't it be great if there was a program that would like just take all the notifications from all the social media apps and put them together in one in a list? Wouldn't that be wonderful? You Maybe actually can do stuff like that with, with, with Hootsuite. Hootsuite. I hate Hootsuite. Uh, well, oh, you know why? Be okay, why? I thought I was smart. Uh oh. I was smart and stupid when I first became a narrator. So uh -huh. all my projects, I knew when I was going to be delivering them. And I yeah. knew when I was booking everything. I didn't get that as a freelancer, you don't have complete control over your world. So I scheduled all these Hootsuite tweets and social media things announcing uh -huh. this is happening on this day. And this is happening on this day. And then I spent like a month frantically running around trying to figure out what my password was to get back in because Hootsuite kept telling everyone in the world that guess what Daniela right. planned to do this but she hasn't <laughs> she screwed up again right I mean and uh, related to all of this with scheduling um when and you um, have a question about that as well so yeah so ju just because I this kind of feeds back into stuff we were talking about before when I take that, I, I said that I don't schedule back to back. I tend to leave spaces in between. So that way I will then backfill those spaces with other projects as they come up closer to the date. But the other thing that I do is I know I can do, I can do six hours of recorded of a finished audio in a day if I needed to, mm -hmm. right? A last minute project came up. I could do six hours of audio if I needed to have that done. It wouldn't be a 12 hour day because I can now do better than a two to one ratio yeah. Yeah. as I'm yeah. going. And I know I can, but when I schedule a book, I tend to schedule for two hours of, of finished audio a day. Yeah. And the reason I do that is not because I'm trying to shortchange myself, but because there's a lot of the work that takes place outside of the booth. There is staying in touch with all of you. There is staying in touch with the publishers. There is everything that I'm doing that is not audiobook related. There's, yeah, there's all something other could pieces. go wrong, and you've right. got to give yourself the grace to accept that. That you know something mm -hmm. could go wrong, like absolutely drilling right outside your bedroom window. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. So if if I'm if I put on the schedule for two hours of of recorded audio per day, and I know that I could achieve six, yeah, then you know. When, whenever I'm scheduling with the publishers and they say it's a 13 hour book, I'm booking enough days as if I was going to take it for two. Yeah. Does yeah. that mean I'm giving up work? I don't really think so because I am not, um, I am doing enough other work that isn't this that then comes in and is in shorter pieces that I, I have don't think, re regular reliable income. And that's, that's what's working there. I think it's a false premise that, when you're saying I could do six hours a day, but does that mean I'm giving up work? That's, a, it would not happen. It would not happen. Life would hit you, things would get in the way, and then you would be missing consistency. Right. And consistency is what ends up 
building the portfolio more than big bright spurts of like extra work. It's the cons right. consistency. If you went in and told me, and Vincent had this question, what are your best practices for scheduling audiobooks concurrently? What's doable versus insane? Right. I, um, I have a strong opinion that it's each person is different and do yeah, each, commit each to less than you different. think you can do. Right. This came up in a conversation you and I were having because yeah. um, there are times where you absolutely, you've got yourself booked or, or, or it is a rush job. Yeah. You know, they couldn't find a narrator. You suddenly have time, but they can't let the schedule slip. What I find works well is I know that um, I can do um, four hours, four to five hours, and I then need a break. Right. I need a real, oh, yeah. real break. You were you. That was a brilliant hack. Yeah. So what I tend to do is I'll tend to I'll tend to break three hours, mm. shut the booth down and get the heck away from the booth, take a nap if I can, go go swim if, you know, if we're in the pre-COVID world, I, I would go swim a few laps and then come back because not having worked a full day, but having worked like 75% of what I usually would if I were going to do that and then stopping and then resetting myself means that I can usually do another 50 to 75% when I come back for another session a few hours later. And if more that focused. session is after laps or, yeah. Yeah, you'll exactly. see it in lack of pickups when you work right. that way. Exactly. Yeah. Instead of like going, okay, I'm going to get to four hours and then I'm, no. Take the break after about three, in my case, because four, four to five is comfortable. So take the break after about three, knowing that I'm not fully pushing myself to that limit. I can then come back for multiple times during a 24 hour period doing that. Yes, each session gets a little shorter, but the total time becomes way more than the four to five hours I would have done if I did one session and then felt I blew out my voice. Because because what you're doing, if you think about it, is as freelancers, we have yeah. we have lots of jobs, but we have two main jobs. We're an employee producing mm -hmm. and we're a boss. And you have to be good at both. But we forget to be a boss. We act like we're like employ, you know, minions. Mm -hmm. And we, you know do it, do it, do it. Why am I not finishing it? But I'm learning now from that lesson that right. I, I clock in as the boss. The boss makes the decisions for the scheduling, not the freelancer that wants to work really, really, really hard so that I've got every job on earth and I'll never right. be broke. <laughs> right. right. No, I, I completely understand where you're going with that. Yeah. And that that duality of mind will serve you well if you're trying to figure out how to do that triage, right? Because then you can have that conversation With that, oh, I really want to do that, but wait a minute, no, the boss is going, wait a minute, no, if you do, you know, those kinds of things. So that's the conver that's where you'll have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have that conversation there, you'll never end up getting to the other point. I mean, but things are going to happen, so. you know, they'll like somebody had a hurricane recently. You know, mm -hmm. things happen, you know, life happens. We can't, I'm perpetually astonished that mm -hmm. life happens. I am, I just keep thinking it shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> it, you know, we, we, it is what it is. We just, we, we roll with what we can, you know, it, it, it all happens. But um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about any of this or about other stuff. Whatever so I think we've got me. Vincent. Vincent, okay. did that answer the question or was there a specific, anything else you wanted to ask about or anybody else? I mean, it's a lot. We've got the, I'm going to go and sit down with that. With that. Oh, now uh, I'm seeing people. Before I wasn't seeing people. Now I'm seeing some people. Hi, everyone. Yeah, everyone's the physical view of the relatively empty inbox. Less visible clutter. That's a really good point, Vincent. Right. Right. No, that, that is part of what helps. Realizing that you can use archive, so you don't have to do the hard, I'm throwing all this out. The way email bankruptcy was originally described was that you would take everything that's more than, let's say, a week or two old, delete it, actively delete it, and then send email to everybody in your contact list saying, if you sent me something more than two weeks ago, odds are I've deleted your email. If it was really important, please send me the message again. And what you would find is you'd get very few messages, not because, um, not not because you you what, well ma mainly because what they had sent you they realized didn't need a reply, 
So you would get very few things coming back at you saying that this needed your attention because if it was in your in your inbox for over two weeks, it's not something that you needed to reply to anyway. But that brings up an important, and also Vincent brings, I've got something to yeah. say to Vincent as well, but also it's what I was thinking about the taxes as well. I need to separate business mm-hmm. from personal because half of my emails are like, you know, from my father who's not here anymore, you know, memories. And that's not, you've got to separate it. And then Vincent, I have a, for instance, you say you're juggling three books. I do something. I don't know if Stephen, if you ever do it, it, I find it helps me, but I might get eaten alive by the experts saying, don't, don't, don't do this. Um, I'll work. If I'm doing a nonfiction book in particular, Mm -hmm. And I'm careful with my deadlines. Mm. I will do the nonfiction book in the first slot during the day. Mm. And then I'll do my fiction book in the second slot during the day. Oh, that's funny. When I've, when I've had to do, brain. When I've, yeah, when I've had to do that, I've done that the other way around. I've started off in fiction and I've ended the day in nonfiction when I've had no choice but to do that. So I've been in that situation. It helps. It helps me get through. Yeah. I, and fiction to me is a treat. So, oh, I okay. For me, it, for me, you know. nonfiction is me being a substitute teacher versus, um, versus fiction is the acting challenge. And, um, I have an easier time following the lesson plan, and it, it's, it's more of an emotional commitment to the reality of the text. So, I want to start the day with full power to do the fiction, whereas I, I know that I can teach the material well because I've prepped the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I can be the sub in the afternoon. Like if it's I like, the, it's it. like the, the nonfiction to me is like the grown up stuff. So it's like, I'm yeah. not, I mean, I will do reality and I'm good at it, but reality mm-hmm. isn't my thing. So I like, to me, the nonfiction is like some people, you know, watching rubbish tv like i love yeah. the nonfiction. so it's a it's like something so whatever way you can get through it but vincent if you're doing several books i mean this might not work for some people some people just focus on one thing at a time i like to if i can i try to set, schedule books sequentially so i can give full focus to whatever it is i'm working on yeah but there are just times where you have somebody who's reached out to you and if you're in the situation that i am where i've booked myself assuming I was doing two finished hours a day, but I know I can do six. Then if somebody shows up with a last minute project, yeah, it's happened where I've then split the day to do both projects and turn them both in on time. And I mean, a lot, depending on the book sometimes, but to me, um, I can give really good, strong, I think this might be like an ADD thing, but I don't know. I can give really good, strong focus, Mm -hmm. just not for a really long time. So I don't ever get bored, but what I'm saying is I'm completely mm-hmm. invested. And then in the afternoon, I can be completely invested in something oh, I get different. It. No, that so, works. Hold that on. Works. Once there was a question. I don't want to lose it. Okay. Um, oh, fiction characters and acting with nonfiction, like a teacher, emotions in both. Try out the ordering of each genre as you're both doing... Okay, and just to preface, just and what Stephen says, a very good point. He only does it when he has to, and a lot of people don't like to do it. It's not an ideal situation. So, I mean, if it works for your personality, but it's, don't quote me. (laughs) Um, Do you use um, anything other than Google Tasks for to-do list management? Lisa wants to know. I used to. I used to use a lot of tools, but what I kept realizing was that as these other very minimal tools, um, because the Google tools have never been the most feature laden. There's always been other tools that have way more things and way more bells and whistles. But what I realized was um, I was falling prey to the shiny and new thing, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of promise. Everybody says these things are going to fix things for you. But then what I eventually realized was, wait a minute, the email is already in a database. Gmail is a database. Wait a minute. The tasks are already in a database. They're just not as pretty in this tool that comes built into Gmail as they are in this other thing. If I can just get used to doing them all in this series of things, I can let go of the other subscriptions so I can spend less money. I can understand that it's going to work the way they want, not the way that I 
would prefer. And if I'm comfortable with that, then that's fine. But um, so in doing that over time, I have had a lot of other tools. And then I would realize that I wasn't getting any more efficient by having more things that I was paying for and more different places that everything was going into. Essentially, I was trying to get away from siloed information being in lots of different places and realized that if I had one trusted system, which for me wound up being based around my email, then if I use the tools that were natively connected to that email, then it made it simpler and I was losing less things because the big fear is some important project is going to go and get missed. But if you know that you are using that snooze feature in the email, for example, in order to make it so that I've just agreed to another to a book before we came in here. Oh, and, congratulations. Um, well, you know, and so I, I just scheduled it. Thank you. But so what I did was, and what I tend to do is I take the email of that acceptance once it's on my calendar, but I take the email about it and I have that email pop back up a week before I'm supposed to start the book, just mm. as a little reminder. So then I can make sure, have I gotten all the things? Have they sent me the recordable version of the book yet? Um, you know, have I, you know, have I set enough aside enough time this week to prep the book? Do I have any last minute questions for, for the publisher? right? So that email popping back into my inbox one week before I'm starting is just that reminder going, right, I have this project. I know it's on the calendar, but I know I'm not looking at my calendar the same way as I'm looking at that inbox. Do you so know I just who you are? Popping back in. Yep. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. I'm just so no, excited all. about this subject. Who's that woman that touches things and if she doesn't love them, she throws them away? Marie Kondo? Okay. Is that You are the Marie Kondo of tech. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think I've got her name right. I, yeah, I think you did. You, you did. And and the thing is, right, it's not that these, it's not that all those tools aren't useful. They are incredibly yeah, useful. Right. But what I find is once you've learned what you're going to learn from the tool, then unless that tool is perfect for you, you, you can feel free to let go of it. And you make right. it work for you rather than working the way, being stuck in there. Right. And what I found is, yep, it's a Zen thing where I, I did a lot of these things and then I've been doing less and less and less. And yeah, so between the fact that I did find people who I feel comfortable delegating to, that's hard. Finding people you trust with your business, that's hard, right? Once you have people who you can delegate to, delegate. Even if delegation is they're helping you with social media or you are handing off the research for this book to them. Right. You have to read about transurfing because every single time you talk to me, you bring up all the underpinning concepts of transurfing. I don't know if mm -hmm. anybody knows about it, but that basically life is full of pendulums that gather for us and try to get you in. So each one of these tech programs would be a pendulum trying to get you to buy into their pendulum completely. And you're taking the ideas from it and creating your own right. kind of like, like, wave in the middle where you're in control you're not being controlled by the forces of the pendulums right and you know basically though at some point i had to choose where i was going to be and yeah. when i was completely in the apple universe using apple's built-in tools to do things was great but then just life conspired and i wound up being in the google universe for a number of different reasons so i slowly moved everything over there and once it got moved completely over there it was the same thing. The basic data is in one place. I don't need that same data to be in three different apps, to be on something on my wall, to be in 15 other things. As long as I, as long as I know that my email inbox is going to keep surfacing whatever is truly important for me to focus on today, that becomes my trusted system. And those are the two words. It's trusted system. If you have a trusted system, you've basically built an automated version of your own um, assistant. That's what's going on. You know, the Gmail inbox, because I triage it like that, pops everything back up to remind me. I don't have to sit here thinking about it because I know a week before that book, it's going to pop up. So I don't have to keep the fact that that book is currently, like I couldn't tell you what the title of that book is right now even though I just talked about it before this phone call. But that's because, good. That's how I am with my spreadsheet. Right. It goes on my spreadsheet. And then it's not in my brain. 
Nothing yep. is in my brain at any time ever because it's all been dumped. <laughs> it's right. but it's, it's just that thing out of Harry Potter. It's it's the thing where you've taken it all out of the brain yep. and you've placed it into the immediately. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now we have some questions. Um, Jonathan wants to know how many years did it take for you to achieve that crazy ratio of six finished hours per day? For the record, can we please stress, guys, that's not normal. <laughs> <laughs> it's like well, it's, the person who inspired me to do it was was pj oakland because i kept hearing that pj had an accuracy where he was under one and a half hours of work to a finished hour mm-hmm. and i kept thinking if he can do it i know i can do it mm-hmm. right so because he's not doing anything magical it's just a question of focus mm-hmm. um how long did it take I couldn't tell you because it happens slowly over time. I know that I started at between, depending upon the content, between four to six hours per finished hour. And now I'm down under two, usually closer to one and a half. Do you not um, find the studio different? Because I can e- I easily and regularly, my first book, not even knowing yeah. audiobooks, four finished hours in the studio. But when I'm at home... Yeah. It is, and maybe that's because focus is my struggle. But when I'm at home, four finished hours is hard. Well, in the studio, it's easy. Okay. So, how I work when I'm at home is kind of different from I know how some other people work. I know people who stay in the booth as long as they can. I get out of the booth every half hour, regardless, for a number of reasons. We have two sedentary a job. You you know, you may physically think you are able to sit there, but you are not doing yourself any favors by sitting there for an incredibly long time. So having tea, having coffee, having water, having whatever it is sitting outside the booth, knowing that every time a half hour goes by or 10 pages goes by or whatever the measure is you're using, that you will get out of the booth, that you will then rehydrate you will gargle, you will do whatever it is that makes things for you. And then you will reflect upon the work you just did, then go back into the booth. Hmm. Then if you- I like that, that's an important ingredient. Well, that's sort of the same thing as I was saying before, instead of pushing yourself to the end, you know, do less and then stop. What I'm doing is I'm breaking every half hour, 40 minutes for a short amount of time, even if it's just a bathroom break. Right, I'm, but I I'm like the reflecting because that. that's what you yeah. do when you dream at night. You're reflecting on the day. Your mind, your mind is cleaning it up. You're cleaning well, up what you've just done. Right, and we don't have a director, so you have yeah. to be the director. Since you have to be the the engineer and everything anyway, you yeah. know, taking that break and going, okay, that courtroom scene, how was it? I love that. Oh, I love know. that idea. You yeah. are a genius. Well because I know I'm going to do that, I don't question myself as much in the moment because I know when I step out of the booth, that's when I'm going to think about the work that I did. I honestly think that was a big piece of what got me down under two, uh, two to one. I really love that idea. I'm going to do it tomorrow. That's really, really brilliant because it's like a reset and then you go back in. It's like, I really like that. Wow. Okay. Wow. Of everything else in the okay. entire call, if we edited out the rest of the like hour and whatever, that one bit is perfect. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah. That's really exciting. Um, more and more apps are adding similar functionality. And yeah. I use FreshBooks, this is Vincent, mm-hmm. for my invoicing. And it lets me yeah. also add lots of CRM like data yeah. too. I keep forgetting. What is CRM again? Customer relationship management or customer relationship module, but the C and the R are the important letters there. It's managing your relationship with your customers. Now for us, those customers would either be the publishers or they would be the indie authors. And so most CRMs are the kinds of things where you put in the information, then you have them at the beginning of the sales funnel and and it's it's, it's managing all the emails you've had with that person. So that way, when you're on a phone call, or you're interacting with them, you can bring up that past interaction so you can be as effective a salesperson for yourself as possible. That's what CRMs are about. I think um, I've developed an allergy to acronyms working yeah, with lawyers for too I, long. I completely <laughs> understand. I understand. And like I said, I was using CRM tools as standalone to, and then eventually understood that 
no matter what was going on, I was segmenting the data that I already had and I didn't need to duplicate it again in yet another space. Um, I love this call. I'm kind of hoping I don't get that book now. But don't listen to me, universe. But just in case I don't get it, I'm going to revamp my entire life. Um, as weird as it is. Oh, wait, wait, wait. It's going too fast. Um, oh. oh, I love <laughs> I almost said it again. <laughs> oh, I'm not seeing it because I'm I'm not I seeing know. it. James, I know. James kind of took us off subject. He used, I love that, evidently one of the characters in his book, and he used me as a model. I've never been anyone's character model before. I, I love that. <laughs> um, oh, it's a also, great shortcut to use people, to, to, use, to use other narrators in books. I'm like, we, we work at home, we work in a booth, we, we, we're not moving around. And so getting all of that movement and that interaction with other people and doing those things, it's just, you know, so yeah, so getting out of the booth every half hour to 40 minutes was useful. Uh, and then just realizing if I'm going to be stepping out anyway, letting myself fall into director brain at that point meant that I was, I could be more committed to the scene in the moment because I knew that I was going to post mortem the scene when, when I stepped out of the booth next. I love that idea. I, that's one of my favorite. And also the other thing um, that I never realized until you said it was, if you have a chat with someone, there was one mm -hmm. day where I was too busy. I was just too busy. There was no way I could take time for a chat and I didn't want to, didn't, couldn't face it. So I chatted anyway. And you know what? I went back in full mm -hmm. of renewed energy and finished in record time right. because you got to, you've got to be a good boss. You've got to make your employee like their job. That's part of your job, making your employee happy. I try to keep this from feeling like a job. I mean, that's really yeah. kind of the point. Um, I want the time behind the microphone to be the enjoyable part of the day. Yeah. Right. And you know, I want the hardest thing to be reaching out to let somebody know my availability. Because you're having an intimate conversation with somebody that's right. lying, going to sleep at night listening to you. And if you don't want to be there. Right. What kind of energetic conversation is that? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Stephen J. Cohen, I Danielle still need. Do final word of wisdom even though i think you've given us so much wisdom uh -oh. i don't know how you're going to fit more in but for our youtube audience in the next 60 years <laughs> oh my gosh i'm not even sure what to say um i know that i think the big problem is that for a lot of people this isn't a first career choice this is something that people kind of come to. And a lot of times people come to it with employee mindset. And this is something you were talking about before. Mm -hmm. um, the hard part is leaving the, we don't come to it with a business owner mindset. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not realizing that we are basically a production company that only has one talent on staff that happens to also be us, right? So it's, we're flipping the hat and we're not spending as much time being the business owner or the person promoting the business or the other things, we just keep thinking that that talent is all, all we are. And when we do that, we start to turn that time behind the microphone into work. And if that becomes work, then why are we doing this? Yeah. Yep. Marie Kondo did again. Yeah. You got to love it. Anything you don't love has to go out. I suddenly see a heart on Lisa's profile that wasn't there before. There it goes. It's gone. All right, now, see, this is why is. I don't allow the guests to get distracted. <laughs> it's back. The heart's back. <laughs> Stephen, thank you so much. I can't tell you how much, because I because I'm big on this whole back to school thing. This time of year, we've all got a fresh start. Mm -hmm. And you know, the weather's, the nights are closing in, we could eat healthy soups, we could, you know, make new friends, make new connections, get busy with new books and have a wonderful holiday. And then next year we're flying. And you've just given us the tools to start doing that. Well, I'm, if, if it helps, that's great. 
It does. It does. It's wonderful. I know me. I'm raring to go. I'll be superwoman. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. It's been a pure pleasure, as always. Stephen, just stay with us forever. You're, I'm going to find out that what that term is, but you're our, our regular MSNBC Cup of Joe guest. I'm a regular commentator. <laughs> yeah, commentator. That's what it is. Sure. Resident artist or something. There we are. Right. Yeah. Bye, no everyone. All, that works. I love that. I love that. Bye. Mwah. Take care. Bye. Rhythm song. Come on, everybody, tap along. First you scrub a dub, then you tap and rub. You might have to yell when you hear the bell ring out loud and long. Oh, everybody.